good morning, everyone. Let's stand and open in prayer, please. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do come into your holy presence this morning, boldly in the name of Christ, not based on our own righteousness, which are like filthy rags according to your word, but based on the precious blood of Jesus. We remember again the cross of Calvary, and there, on that altar, Jesus' life was given for us. We thank you now that Jesus was raised from the dead and in heaven now, and Lord, he is our hope, he is our savior, he is our redeemer, and Lord, we give you all the glory and praise this morning. As we enter into the Advent season, we think again of the humility of Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who humbled himself, came into the world with the express purpose to die for our sins. So Father, as we open this morning, we pray that your spirit would move freely among us. Lord, we praise you. Thank you, and our joy is in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we begin our service with the time of Christmas, as we begin our Christmas carols. 124, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. screen to 127, Thou didst leave thy throne. <clears throat> Pardon? You're right. I got so excited about singing. <laughs> Trust that uh, you've come with hearts full of anticipation to hear what the Lord God Almighty has got to say to us this morning. Our key verse this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice at thy salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence once again with hearts that are full of anticipation to hear the truth of your word that we will hear this morning. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that gives us guidance. Let us to have ears to hear the truth that will be revealed to us this morning. And may our spirits be open, O oh Lord to trust and obey you 
in all things. We lift up Pastor Bobby as he will come later to share your truth. Give him the wisdom, the courage, and Lord, that he would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Thank you once again for this blessed opportunity that we have as your children to come into this place. We know that it's just a building, but Lord, we have congregated here as your children together to corporately worship and praise your holy name. As we continue to praise you in song, may your name be honored and blessed. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> it's been a long time since I stood in front of people leading singing, and I'm thankful to be here. But as I look at this next hymn, I led singing in a Baptist church for many, many years. And there was some rule in Ecclesiastes that said the Baptist didn't sing the third verse. It was verse 1, 2, and verse 4. But this morning we're going to sing them all. You remain, please remain seated.
sing our last uh, Christmas hymn this morning, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly, 143 in your hymn books. <laughs> A blessed first Sunday of Advent to all of you. Welcome to church this morning, kids and families and all of you. It's so good to see you all here today. I am so looking forward to spending the next four Sundays, kids, around the Advent wreath together. And actually, in Disciple Land, we're going to continue with another Advent wreath and our own special little Advent services for the next few weeks. But today we're going to, as a whole church family, light the first candle of Advent. And I'm going to spell a word and see if you know which word I've spelled by the time I'm finished, okay? It's not too long, so it goes like this. H-O-P-E. What is it? You got it. Well done. Hope. Our first candle of Advent is the hope candle. And we light it because it's a special Advent gift that God gives to us. And I, I was doing some reading and some thinking about that word hope. And did you know that hope needs to have waiting tied to it? Because you can't have hope if you aren't waiting now, you can wait without hope. That's possible. You can expect things without hope because you can expect bad things to happen. Some people do that. You can be on the lookout for trouble and problems. That's possible to do. And you can wait for things like that to happen. In fact, you know, the Lord Jesus told his disciples when he was on earth, he said to them, he said, in this world, guess what? You're going to have trouble. That's right. And there's trouble in this world, right, kids? You probably know all about it. Jesus said, we're going to have trouble in this world. So we can be on the lookout for trouble. We can keep our eyes open for trouble and wait for trouble. But that's not hope. We might need to do it sometimes, but that's not hope. And that's not what we're talking about this morning. What we're talking about this morning is something very different. It's waiting with anticipation for God's goodness. It's being on the lookout for the good things that God has planned and is doing and is going to bring to pass because he promised he would. That is what hope is. And I wanted to tell you a story about a guy in the Old Testament. He was a prophet. His name was Jeremiah. 
And he was called a nickname. You know what his nickname was? The Weeping Prophet. He doesn't sound like a very happy guy, does he? He was called the Weeping Prophet because he saw so much trouble in his life. So many sad, difficult, challenging, hurtful, harmful, awful things happened in Jeremiah's lifetime. Some of them happened because of bad people. Some of them happened because people made wrong decisions. Some of them happened because of sin. There was all different reasons why Jeremiah saw so many awful, awful things happen. In fact, Jeremiah was living in Jerusalem probably at the time when Daniel was taken by the Babylonians. We've been talking about Daniel. And Jeremiah was still living in Jerusalem when the Babylonians came back and wrecked the city. He saw lots of awful stuff. And there's a book in the Bible called Lamentations, and most people think the prophet Jeremiah wrote this book. And Lamentations means sorrowing. Oh, wouldn't you just love to read a book called Lamentations? And in this book, the prophet Jeremiah tells about all of the sad trouble that he has seen. But you know what? The prophet Jeremiah wasn't only a guy who looked for trouble. He wasn't only a guy that saw the sad things going on. Because right in the middle of that book of Lamentations, right at the very heart of that sad, sad story, Jeremiah says, yet. Yet is an awesome word. Trouble, 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 awful, 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 yet. I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. And he says, I tell this to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Do you know in Hebrew, the words, therefore, I will wait for God, are the same words that were used when he said, therefore, I have hope. It's exactly the same thing. When we are waiting for God to do something good, to bring about the promises he has promised he will bring about, to work things together for our hope and a future, to bring salvation and redemption, when we have our eyes open for that, we are hoping and we are hopeful people. And Jeremiah was a hopeful prophet even though he was also a weeping prophet. We can be both. Kids, Advent is a time of waiting. We're waiting for something good. I know you are. But it's also a time to practice hope. Do you want to practice being a hopeful person? We could use more hopeful people. Christians are supposed to be a peculiar people. And being a hopeful person is being peculiar. You can practice during Advent. I have some suggestions. There are no Advent police that are going to make you follow these suggestions. You don't have to do them at all. But kids, if you want to practice being hopeful, here's a couple of ideas. When you're setting out your nativity scene, maybe you have that at your house, what about if you tuck baby Jesus away for a few weeks, put him in a safe place so you know where he is, and bring him out on Christmas morning? That way you can practice all of Advent seeing the nativity set that's not complete yet but you know it will be, and you can look forward to that, bringing Jesus out. What about your Christmas tree? Is it up? Is it decorated? Are the lights on? What about having a special time each night when it's the time that you wait for to plug in those lights? Maybe every night at supper, that's when you turn your tree on, and you wait all the dark afternoon until it's time to plug them in. Maybe. Here's a hard one. Christmas cookies. Mm-hmm. This is maybe harder for mom, I don't know. 
bake in those Christmas cookies? What about this one? You bake them. You make them. And then you put them in a freezer for Christmas. Woo Maybe have a little taste to make sure they're okay. There's no point in freezing them if they're no good, right? <laughs> those are some suggestions. Kids, we can practice being hopeful, looking forward to the good things to come, preparing for them, keeping our eyes open and waiting, like the prophet Jeremiah, like other people we're going to talk about during our Advent time as well. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this wonderful gift of hope. Thank you for calling us to be hopeful people. Help us to have eyes that are always on the lookout for your goodness, the goodness of God. In spite of and in the midst of trouble and and sorrow and hard things, help us not to give up hope, but to eagerly anticipate and wait for your goodness to manifest itself. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus coming. We thank you for that great gift. And we thank you that our hope is in him. We pray that you would bless us this Advent season with this wonderful gift of hope. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, kids, I'll see you in Disciple Land. Good morning, folks. Well, now you're awake if you were nodding off. Well, here we are. It's snowing outside. Oh, isn't that? It, it is the Advent season, isn't it? But I think that's one of the traps of the Christmas season is we think that every Christmas that has ever been, there's always been a warm fire in the snow gently falling in the background. Believe it or not, the first Christmas did not look like the Christmases of today. And we're going to explore that over the next four weeks during the Advent season. Uh, Please stand as we read God's word. And we are in Luke chapter 2. Pardon me, Luke chapter 1. I'm more looking forward to Christmas Eve, I guess. We're in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. And Luke writes, And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty things with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Our loving Father, we do thank you again for this precious time around your word. We thank you for this church, for Glen Ridge Bible Church, for the elders, for the oversight, for the board, for Angela, for Jurgen, for all those who are ministering here. Just thank you again for your sustaining grace in our lives. We just thank you again for the strong witness of Glenridge. And Father, we pray that, that that would continue on, that we would hold forth the word of God that is precious to us. And in it is the story of Jesus, the great work of salvation and redemption and reconciliation and hope for the future. And so we as, as we enter into the Advent season, Lord, we pray your blessing on us this special time of year where we consider the coming of Christ, born to a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. Father, we pray for those who are hurting, for those who are in pain, for those who are sorrowing, for those who are unemployed, for those who are struggling mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, We lift them all up to you, knowing that you are the great physician who heals all and gives us the grace 
day by day. Father, we pray your blessing on the public reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mine, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge, whether it's particularly dead about a doornail. I might have inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the dead, deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in this simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. We begin our Christmas season at home with the reading of a Christmas carol. And as we begin the Advent season, there's something we need to begin with. There can be no doubt about that whatsoever. But unlike the death of Jacob Marley, whose death will overshadow the redemptive story of that miser Ebenezer Scrooge, what we need to begin with is rescuing Christmas from the trap of familiarity and the sense of sentimentality. We need a contextual framework to understand Christmas. We need to understand what it was that was happening in real time to real people in a real place. So often today, having been, we are removed 2,000 years from those original events, we forget that Mary was a real young teenage girl that Joseph had real struggles trying to come to an understanding of what was happening, that there was not really an innkeeper per se, a miserly old man who wanted to make an extra buck and gave them room in the stable, that the Magi were not there that first Christmas Eve, and in fact, there were not only three of them. We need to rescue Christmas from its contemporary understanding. We need to understand that Christmas trees and all the sorts and the trappings of Christmas, as wonderful and a great blessing that they are to us today, were not present at that stable 2,000 years ago. These are modern ideas that we've applied to the Christmas season. And some of us have strong feelings. Some of us don't celebrate Christmas in the quote-unquote traditional sense. Nevertheless, what we do celebrate at this time of year is the birth of our Savior. And if you are a born-again, blood-bought, disciple of Christ, it is a precious time. Was Jesus born in December on the 25th, that most silent and holy night? I hate to break it to you. Kids, you may want to cover your ears. No, he wasn't. But that doesn't take away from the significance of God's saving grace. That in fulfillment of the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3, in loving fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, Jesus Christ was born. And in a time in a world today where there seems to be no hope, he still shines forth as the candle of hope. So this Christmas season, we are going to gather together and celebrate Christmas. There was no drummer boy. There was no Mary wearing blue. There was no donkey necessarily that she rode. And we have to start sifting through legend to see the truth about Christ. I think you're getting the picture here. What I want to do is I want to step into the shoes of the people who were there that first Christmas at the birth of Christ. We want to look at what Mary was thinking, what Joseph was grappling with, all those who were associated with that first Christmas, the angelic host, the threat that Herod felt that a child was born and threatened his rule. And so we're going to begin with the mother of Jesus. And she was just that. She was biologically the mother of Christ and contributed her DNA in that egg to Jesus. And so we're going to ask ourselves this morning, and you should, if you're a student of the Bible, ask the Bible questions. And I like to get into the minds of the people who were there in biblical times. It's a great encouragement to me. 
And so right now we're going to begin with, what did Mary think on? What were her thoughts that first Christmas? And of course, when we talk about Mary, the bulk of her story is found in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel that elevates women to a place of, of dignity in the kingdom of heaven. That they too, women, are created in the image of God and are precious to him. And so when we see Mary's life here, the good Dr. Luke sets out to record the events of Jesus. As we studied Acts, what seems like many moons ago now, he set it out as an orderly account. A great, gifted writer, a Greek scholar, and a very intelligent man. He sets out this orderly account. There were other accounts of Jesus. There were other quote-unquote gospels that were not divinely inspired. They were not as complete as the physician Luke wanted. And so he sets out to write to Theophilus, which is an extension of the church today, really. What happened in the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ, and what it means for the world, what it means for you. And so that brings us to another difference between Luke's account, in that it being orderly compared to those that were out there at that time. He had that desire. The difference was that he was led by the Holy Spirit to record what we have in Scripture today. That sets it apart. Matthew and Mark and eventually the, the Apostle John would write the gospel that bears his name and the revelation of Jesus Christ. When it comes to the gospels, they all bear that incredible distinction of being led by the Spirit of God. He moves the pen of the gospel writers. <clears throat> Luke's gospel gives us a unique opportunity. To, an opportunity to listen. To be, to be in the room when these... Uh, supernatural conversations take place. We get to hear the announcement from the angel to Mary. Blessed are you. You are favored. You shall bring forth the Holy One. We get to, to peek into the mind of Joseph as he has a dream and in that dream and in that vision as he, is coming to, as he comes to the conclusion to secretly divorce his wife. You shall name him Jesus. He is the Son of the Most High. We get to see, again, the, the birth of Christ. So we begin in Luke's gospel, and we didn't read it this morning, but it opens with the forerunner. It opens with the announcement of John the baptizer's birth and Jesus Christ's coming. We have the conversation between Zacharias and the temple, and that announces that forerunner, the John the Baptist, but the difference between Zacharias, and we'll see in a moment, Mary, is that he became speechless because he didn't believe it. He said, I know this for certain, for I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And there we see his doubt in the power of God to bring life to a barren womb. That translates to the gospel. There are many who doubt the power of the gospel to bring life, but it does. Jesus Christ saying, I came to give life. He gives life abundantly. He gives eternal life. He gives that security and that great truth. But Zechariah, even though he ministered in the temple, he had doubts about God's power to give him a son. And so he's rendered speechless. But when it comes to the announcement to Mary, her mind didn't go to doubt, but came to methodology. It wasn't so much a he can't, but how can he? And the angel explains you'll be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. He'll be the active agent in the pregnancy of Christ. There will be a supernatural miracle will take place. It will take place in your womb. And there, the Son of God will come into the womb, your womb, Mary, and be born of a virgin in fulfillment of what was prophesied by Isaiah. They're a young, young woman. Some believe as young as 13. I lean toward around 15 or 16. But nevertheless, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. The fact is, if my 15-year-old daughter came to me and said, I'm going to get married and I'm pregnant, I'm pretty sure I would die. But that was how it was in those days. That gives us context, cultural context. It was very normal. We'll see next week, Lord willing, the process of betrothment, engagement, but this week we're looking at Mary. 
And Mary's been given a message that she shall become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. His name will be Jesus. He is the son of the Most High. He will save his people from his sins. He is the greater son of David. He is the long-anticipated Messiah of Israel and Savior of the world. He is the one whom I promised in the garden. I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I promised to David. I promised to Solomon. I promised and faithfully kept throughout even the corrupted rule of the kings. To this day, he is the one you have been waiting for. And Mary has to process this. She has faith, but faith can't be divorced from reason. She has to understand in her mind what's happening here. That a supernatural occurrence is going to take place and she will be pregnant without ever ever having known a man. This results in her receiving this encouragement that your, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, she's pregnant. And Mary begins to see the miraculous work of Christ. And no doubt as a student of the Torah, as women were, they knew the Torah. She knew that this was the forerunner. This was the one who would come. The one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. She goes to see Elizabeth. She travels to Judea. And there has a conversation with her, is encouraged No doubt they're trading stories of the miraculous work of Christ. But when we come to this conversation, we see that Mary, in response to this conversation, in response to what God God is doing, breaks out into praise and to worship because of who God is, what he is doing, his faithfulness and his love for his nation and for the world. She just, her heart explodes with praise and worship. And does your heart explode with praise and worship. It's not a matter about feeling. We'll see that in a moment. Yeah, her soul exalts, her feelings, her emotions. They explode. Worship is divorce of emotion. It's not a matter of I feel like worshiping. Worshiping is because of who God is. That's the biblical understanding of worship. And Mary's moved to worship. It reminds me of our key verse this morning. And any of us, and when you're studying Scripture, it's good to compare Scripture, to contrast Scripture. Scripture, it's great that way. It's one of the fundamental rules of numeretics. It's to contrast and compare. And so it reminded me of, of Hannah's praise and worship, her prayer in 1 Samuel. It's sometimes called the Magnificat of the Old Testament. What we have before us now is the Magnificat of the New Testament. And it's called that because of the similarities between these two songs. Hannah praises God. And that frame, that frames the narrative of their stories. It highlights God's mercy in their lives. Both songs go hand in hand with the birth of a son and the salvation that son brings. Now they differ in that as Hannah's prayer, as her song unfolds, she thanks God for a victory over her enemies and primarily she has in view Paniah, her, her, that rival wife who gave, who gave Elkanah a whole whack of sons and she was barren. That was her immediate enemy. And she mocked her and ridiculed her, humiliated her, even though her husband loved her. But Mary praises God for his salvation that's coming through the the promised Messiah, her Savior, her firstborn son. And how that salvation, in the same way Samuel brought dignity and life and salvation, as it were, from her ridicule and her humiliation by being born to, to Hannah, the difference between her son and Mary's son is that this son, when when he is born, will bring salvation to Israel, to the entire nation. And the extension of that is, according to the Abrahamic promise, the covenant there, is that all those who bless you will be blessed, that he will be a greater blessing, that he will be salvation to the ends of the earth to all those who believe. Now, when we come to the actual focus of Mary's praise, her, her prayer here, it's God. She begins with, my soul exalts the Lord, my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded, and so on and so forth. Her focus is so laser focused. It's focused on God. We see her open that text. 
worshiping the Lord. The soul, speaking of the mind, of emotions, that essence of mankind that, that is unique in all of creation. Now I'm going to probably get some flack for this, but I'm going to share a truth with you. Animals, relax, pets, calm down, don't have emotions the way we do. Okay. They act on instinct. They do. That's not to say they don't have a hint of emotion. That's not, there's some, sometimes I look in my dog's eyes. Some of you saw the post I put up this week of her sneaking into my gym and begging me with those eyes, love me. She just wants me to pet her and take her for a walk and give her a treat and then she's done with me. It's instinct. What sets mankind apart is emotion, creativity, the ability to think rationally, to express those emotions. And that's what Mary's doing here when she speaks about her soul, the expression of her love for God. But then she goes on to say, talking about her spirit rejoicing in God, my Savior. There she praises, as she praises in her mind emotionally, she's moved by her spirit. That is the, that is the part of mankind that is uniquely knit to God. The lost seek to fill their spirit with anything but God. There's only God who is spirit who fills that vacant hole we have as part of the sin nature, the separation between mankind and God. And so when we say, I don't feel like praising God, I would just say it's not about feeling. Our spirits, according to Ecclesiastes, it's, it's, it's in our nature to worship. He's put eternity in our hearts. And Mary praises not only in, in mind and emotion, in her soul, but her spirit, that that is uniquely created in the Imago Dei, in the Im image of God. You know, do we come together and in our private time worship God with this type of fervor, with this type of fire in our bellies? Do we come not only emotionally, but emotions can be dangerous at times. Do we come with our minds, but our minds can wander. But do we come with a great groaning in our spirit to acknowledge and exalt the living God? Well, Mary does. Now the context, as I said, Mary's arrived to visit Elizabeth. And what, um, what's amazing here is that as they come together, and this, this, this moves her to praise God, because when she says hello to Elizabeth, what happens? What does John the Baptist do? Yet, not yet born. Begins leaping in the belly of his mother. Now in Zacharias and Elizabeth's case, God worked in their bodies to perform a miracle. And I said this in the opening, that God brought a dead womb to life and enabled them to become pregnant the natural biblical way. Now that would have been quite an experience. You know, Laura's been pregnant five times. And each time, as those children have grown in her womb, I've always found it amazing to see the movements and the ripples in her stomach. And to put my hand there and to feel this kid kick. And to punch. Pretty sure a couple of them head-butted me. It's an amazing, and I can't, I have no context. No context of understanding, but you get pregnant or women, to, or moms together, oh yeah, I remember, oh yeah, I remember, oh, yeah, I remember. And I sit there like, oh yeah, I remember too. No, you don't. But that's an incredible experience, this barren woman, long dead, a long past the age of childbearing, sensing the movement of her yet-to-be-born son in her womb in response to whose company, whose presence he is in. It's not Mary's. He does not leap in Elizabeth's womb because he's in the presence of Mary. There are many who worship Mary or find her to be a conduit to God. And it's important that as we examine the text, that Mary is praising God, Elizabeth and John are worshiping the yet-to-be-born Christ. When the Magi come, they worship the child. When Mary worships, she worships the living God. This was an incredible thing to see. And, it's, and it is. It's a, you know, I, I, I can remember the, when Laura was pregnant with our first child, with Emma, 
And the, the first time she experienced that fluttering in the movement of Emma in her belly, and Emma hasn't stopped since. But when you add that in Elizabeth's case, she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and Mary is moved in her spirit, we're reminded that God is spirit. He calls those of us who are his to worship in the spirit. This wasn't just a coincidence. This wasn't a midwife meeting. I remember taking Laura to see the midwives, and I'd never seen so many pregnant women in one room before. I was flabbergasted. It's like, is everybody in town pregnant? What happened? It's got to be in the water. These two women come together in the same place at the same time, Mary to be encouraged, Elizabeth to be encouraged. This was a supernaturally, divinely appointed meeting between the forerunner, John the baptizer, and the one he would preach, whose sandals he would say, 30 years later, that he was unworthy to untie. This was a supernatural greeting. Of course, it wasn't physical in the sense that John the Baptist prostrated himself before the Lord. This was a, this was a spiritually moved act of praise and worship of the yet unborn Jesus Christ. And so now this child leaps in the room. That baby, John the baptizer, as an infant, not even yet born, the spirit moves in Elizabeth, moves in him, sense something very special about that baby. People still sense something special about Christmas, but it does fall into the trap of sentiment of nostalgia, of Christmases of their youth, if they were good. For some, Christmas is a hard time. Defenses go up, hearts become cold because of past experiences of hurt or rejection, an absent father, an absent mother, an abusive spouse. But it does move in us a response. The Lord demands a response. As the gospel is presented throughout the world today faithfully by Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastors and, and men of God, the question goes out, what have you done with this Jesus who came and born of a virgin? What have you done with him? What, 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 have you, what is your thought upon him? Do you worship him? Do you believe in him? Do you trust in him or do you reject him? John the Baptist leapt for joy. And even in the womb, at their first meeting, symbolically through their mothers, John the baptizer there begins, already begins pointing to Jesus and rejoices in the superior role Christ has to play in just a few years. And even there, yet unborn, he is worshiping the unborn child. It's important to understand the Holy Spirit grabbed hold of Elizabeth, grabbed hold of John the baptizer, and under the influence and leading of the Holy Spirit, she knew that that child that Mary was carrying was the Messiah. Elizabeth's emotions, her remarks, everything says, she says directly to God. The very first act toward Jesus, after the announcement of his birth, the very first interaction we see from the world in the person of John the Baptist And his mother Mary, according to Luke, is worship, is praise. And the reality begins to to come upon Mary just who it is she is carrying in her womb. Who it is she will give birth to. Who it is she will nurse and care for and protect in those early years of his life. It begins to unfold in her mind the immense responsibility not only of motherhood, but being the mother of the Messiah. But she also weighs the great cost. She'll be ostracized from society. She will be labeled a harlot. She is vulnerable to persecution under the Mosaic Code. She could, though they were under Roman rule, she could have been stoned to death for her apparent infidelity. Humiliated, rejected, Joseph 
considers divorcing her. And actually, as he's coming to the conclusion of divorcing her, that's when the angel intervenes. There is a great cost to be counted among Christ's people. And are you prepared to pay that cost? Are you ready to lay down your pride and your arrogance? Am I ready to lay down my pride and my self-sufficiency and be prepared to be mocked and ridiculed and hated by the world because it first hated my Lord? There is a cost. It is a narrow way. It's not easy. And not many go that way. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. All the daisies and the wonderful grass that leadeth to hell. But to follow Jesus, though it is difficult, it is challenging. Sometimes it's a grind to be a disciple of Christ. I know that what's waiting for me beyond this world is so much better, so more, so glorious that as I weigh it out, it's not even a contest. And I tell the world, in humility, bring it on. Because I know who I belong to. You know, Mary had faith and trusted, and she knew to bear the Messiah would be great work. It's great work just to be a mother, to give birth and nurse and change diapers in the middle of the night, to have your husband say, hey, the baby's crying, you better go get her. Not that I ever did that. But you add to that the responsibility of caring for the Messiah, to have your knowledge begin to expand upon his purpose in the world, Mary rejoices. She trusts in the word of God. She, Elizabeth says that she's blessed because of her belief in the fulfillment of what the Lord had spoken. She was a, a woman of humility and praised the Lord for his goodness. But she makes it very clear she is not to be worshipped. She is blessed. And she says so in the Magnificat that she is the one who will be blessed throughout the generations in verse 48. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. And she is blessed. She was blessed. She is unique. She is set apart. How many women here have given birth to the Messiah? That's why she's blessed. She is unique. It was her DNA through the Davidic line because she was a part of the Davidic line. And you can get into a law, a big study about how the male line was cursed, but the female line through Mary, Joseph gave him the legal right to rule the Davidic throne. Mary gave him the physical right to rule from the Davidic throne. We can unpack all that, but we'll be here. The point is that God was faithful to this promise, and she praises God because she was set apart. She was humble. She was lowly. She did not live in a palace. She was going to marry a carpenter. And these aren't the carpenters of today. The carpenters of the first century were very poor. And they would bring their wares to the marketplace, and there they would sell. The, they were not rich, as we would count one to be rich. Very humble. But the word of God says those who are humble before God will be raised up. And those who are proud and haughty, as we saw through the life of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel over the last few months, will be brought low. And she praises God. That's why we call them Nificant, because in the Latin, the first word is Magnificat, which means glories. She glories in God for his goodness, for his character. And praise, it means she honors him. She, she has this deep admiration and love for God, and that she seeks to, to worship God. You know, my prayer is that my heart would be this way, that I would praise and honor the Lord in all the areas of my life. Will we fall short? Yes. Should we use that as an excuse not to be holy? No. Be set apart. Be peculiar. Worship the Lord. She declares the greatness of God. Her soul magnified the Lord. She, it was habitual. And she kept doing it and kept praising the Lord, no doubt all her life. As she saw the miracles of her son, that first miracle when he turned water to wine. No, the baby, no, the, the infant Jesus, according to the Gospel of Thomas, did not create little birds out of the sand of the seashore. No, he didn't put little curses on his friends. And loved ones, if you have heard that and you believe in that, please, I I, I plead with you, that's not the gospel. 
The first miracle Jesus performed according to the Apostle John is water to wine. And from then on, Mary begins to see Jesus transitioning into his office of Messiahship practically as the Son of God leading the way to the cross. And there she was, not only at the birth of Christ, but at the death of Christ and at the resurrection of Christ. She centered her thoughts that first Christmas. It was not called Christmas then, but that first Christmas. Her thoughts were centered on God. God. How often our thoughts are on presents and wrapping paper and Christmas trees and tinsel. Does anybody even use tinsel anymore? I don't know. We don't. My cat ate them all the time before. Our thoughts become consumed with the perfect meal, the perfect gift, the perfect Christmas. And I say this every year. The perfect Christmas happened 2,000 years ago. Give it a rest. It's a load off of my shoulders. Although we have to have cabbage rolls or it's not Christmas. Her thoughts were centered on God. You know, when we gather around the tree every Christmas morning, you know, we open our Bibles and we read. We read from the beginning. We see again the faithfulness of God. We see those covenants, those promises, the the faithfulness of God leading up to the moment of the conception of Jesus, supernaturally the Holy Spirit, to the birth of Christ, right to his death and resurrection. And our thoughts, even though I know the kids, even a little bit of me, thinking, what's under that tree? We are focused on God because all those presents under the tree are symbolic and pictures of the greatest gift given to us by our Heavenly Father, that's Jesus Christ. Mary's mind was on God. And she thinks about what God has done in her own life. And secondly, moves on to the broader scope of what God is doing in a general sense. But she never focuses, never selfishly focuses on herself or fall and falls into the pride of sin. She doesn't lament her circumstances. She doesn't complain that she's poor. She doesn't concern herself with the criticisms of those who believed she was unfaithful. She wasn't even focused on Joseph. Instead, all her focus was praising God. So what do we do at Christmas time? Have your turkey. I don't eat turkey. Stop looking at me like that. Enjoy your tree. Put up your lights. Come by my house. I've got candy canes. But focus this Christmas. And I say this to myself because as the Lord lays a message on me and I preach it to you, he's first impressed it upon me and convicted me. Is your mind upon God? Is it upon Christ our Lord? Do we take time to praise God for his salvation at Christmas time? Or are we too focused on Bing Crosby? Or good old Ebenezer, or Norman Rockwell, or sled riding, or buying presents? That's the focus of mainstream world today. You know, we we worship the Lord every week. We schedule into our weekly Bible studies. But how often do we personally set a time to just worship? Just come to the presence of the Lord and worship. That's what Mary does here. Just comes humbly to the presence of God and worships and praises him. Are we magnifying the Lord? Are we praising the Lord? Am I doing that? Do we consider how much love and mercy he has shown us, the most lowliest people of the world? And that's, that's what we are. We're the lowliest. Her mind was on the Lord. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me, in verse 49. And goes, he has done mighty deeds with his arms, scattering the proud, bringing down rulers while exalting the humble. What many things have God done for Mary? Well, she knew that she needed a savior. She knew that. Mary can't save you. She was a fallen sinner just like the rest of us. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, cannot save you. Church tradition cannot save you. Lighting candles at Christmas time, that doesn't save you. A belief and a faith and a trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, loved ones, that will save you. That will save you. A trust in the Jesus of Scripture. Not cultural Jesus, not hipster Jesus, 
not the invention of the worlds of Jesus, because behind all those false Jesuses is the liar, Satan. You need to trust the Jesus of Scripture. He was not a blonde Caucasian man. He was a Jew from Nazareth, born of Mary, born for you. And Mary realized that, that this young child developing in her womb, supernaturally conceived, was her Savior. In all of creation, she had been noticed, and to her, the great honor had been given. And she testifies about God's care for her. And you know what, loved ones? God sees you. It is such a sad state. Oh, with our young people. Where they just, they're disappearing. They don't feel like they are seen or heard or understood. And the world has been crushing young people underfoot. And they begin to become so desperate, they have no idea what the purpose of life is. And I tell them, God sees you. To God, you are precious. Don't believe me? Meet me at a cross 2,000 years ago where Jesus died for you. That's where our thoughts should be. God sees you. And oftentimes, he will use the least likely person to clearly, clearly demonstrate his mercy and his power. You know, I end with these few thoughts here that he uses the weakest of the tribes of Israel. He uses them. Judges chapter 6. The fact that he chose Israel, not because they were a great nation, but because he sovereignly chose them because they were the least of the nations. He loves the unloved, like Leah in Genesis 29. He uses the weak. And Mary would have known these stories as they were passed down to her. The unassuming according to human standards, the powerless, the despised. That's who God uses to manifest his power. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He would even use a teenage girl of no reputation, no influence, no wealth, no popularity, no social standing. But God would use her to bring forth the Savior of the world. His name is Jesus. She heard the stories. No doubt as her mind considered the salvation of God, she goes on to see, to think about the exalted, uh, those who are humbled and filled the hungry with good things. She had heard the stories that were passed down from generation to generation. How God loved his people, even though they rejected him constantly. How he gives us significance and belonging like he did to the nation of Israel. A ruled people again under the cruel hand of Rome. Mary was an outcast, so if you're an outcast this morning, guess what? You're in good company, because Jesus was an outcast. She personally experienced the mighty arm of God, because she knew now the great hope of Israel, the hope of the world, that time was now. And now she's miraculously pregnant because of all the things the Lord has done for her. And from now on, she will be blessed of all generations. She's really representative of what it's like to experience God's wonder, God's grace, and God's mercy. And that's why we call her blessed. She's not pious. She does not contain in herself any sense of deity. She's a woman, just like every other woman here. But she gave birth to the Savior. And that's when her song turns, as we end with this, the great hope for her people, for the nation of Israel, and for all those who will be delivered to her son. And though the tense, the verb tense that she uses is still future, we look back and know that that has happened. But there is a sense where it's still future because Jesus is coming again. We cannot separate the child in the manger from the one whose feet will touch the Mount of Olives and the mountain will crack under the weight of his glory and presence and, and righteousness. It's the same person. It's the same Son of God. So even though she was speaking prophetically of Jesus' ministry during the first century, it is also speaking of his ministry in the end, where he will exalt the humble, and he will tear down and judge the proud. Humility, I just wanted to share this thought because I thought it was a really good thought. I always think about humility and Mary's humility and the humility of Jesus Christ and the humility of all those who are God's people. Humility is, quote, the natural product of reflection about who God is, end quote. 
You can become very proud until you bring yourself into the presence of God. And like Isaiah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, the one who preached the great news of the virgin conceiving and giving birth, Emmanuel, God with us, came into the presence of God in chapter, uh, chapter 6. There he prostrated himself before God because he knew he was a woeful, sick, twisted individual in the light of God's goodness. I think more of us, myself included, need to do that. Walk in humility. That's what God desires of us, and that's what Mary did. In the ancient world, an individual's relationship with God wasn't a casual affair. Loved one, don't be a casual Christian. It is an awesome thing to be a child of God. It's an awesome thing to know that we worship the living God. He is not, nor never has been, the big guy in the sky. He is the living, holy God. And Mary sensed that. Mary knew that. She had a great awe and deep sense of respect and praise and worship, reserved only for God. We should note their mindsets, both Elizabeth and Mary, as they approached and praised God in a very careful and considerate way. We should appreciate the honor it is, the great blessing to know God. And so as we wrap up Mary's thoughts, the heart of this godly woman, she didn't have wealth. She didn't have power she had no influence, really. She was just a young girl who was betrothed to a carpenter, a very humble trade. She had no authority other than being the mother of Jesus. But she was blessed. She had very little, and probably had very little all her life, as reflected in the life of her son, where the foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And that was Mary's life. But her song reflected such a deep trust in God, a deep trust in his province, promise of deliverance, both for herself, knowing she needed a savior, she needed the Messiah, and for her people, even extending to the ends of the earth. Under Roman rule, Mary proclaimed the mercy of God and that promise that was made to the fathers, to Abraham, was now coming to pass. Messiah is coming. Messiah is going to be born. And in our day today, we could learn a lot from this poor girl in Nazareth. And remember in our time that God has made a promise. He's promised to preserve those souls who have trusted in him who turn to him in repentance, who give him thanks for God's love, for his tender care. We can learn a lot of good theology from Mary. And so those of us who know God, I would encourage you always, even though you, dear sisters, have not given birth to Christ, praise him. To those of you, men, myself included, who are not Joseph, did not have the, the honor and the blessing of raising Christ, I say this as well, bless his name. Praise his name this Christmas. Praise him the way Mary did, with his great love and awe and respect. And though she stayed with Elizabeth for three months, when we come to the presence of the Lord one day, we shall be with him always. And even today, Jesus has promised, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our loving Father, we thank you again for this brief time around your word and the insights into Mary and the thoughts that she had, the praise that she brought you, the worship and the adoration she had for you, most high God. It would be my prayer, Lord, that our hearts would be turned toward you, that we too would prostrate ourselves, whether it be physically, but spiritually, primarily, that we would prostrate ourselves before your holy presence and give you thanks not only for the gift of Christmas, not only for the testimony of those of Scripture, in particular Mary this morning, but because of who you are, a faithful God, holy and set apart, who did not cast us aside, but sought us out in our weakened state, 
in our fallen estate, in our spiritually bankrupt estate, you sought us out and sent your Son to die for us. So we thank you again and praise you, and Lord, it would be the prayer of our hearts that we would reflect the great worship of Mary, who did not worship herself, but worship the one true living God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bobby. You know, the scripture says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the word. This morning, we've heard the word of God through Pastor Bobby. And I was thinking as I was sitting, you know, what a wonderful time if you, today or in the next few weeks, to give your faith, turn your faith over to Jesus Christ, where you could celebrate your rebirth as well as his birth. Let's close by singing, O Come, All You Faithful. Don't feel as though you can't celebrate the traditions of today. That was not my purpose. And it won't be my purpose this Advent season to discourage you from buying me presents. I'm not saying that. I take an extra large tall and cash or check. But, all jokes aside, you know, I really would encourage you, not only at Christmas, Easter, but throughout the year, make your focus in this life the Lord. And praise Him, and worship Him, and love Him. And one day that love will be manifest perfect in his presence. Ephesians chapter 2 is one of my favorite chapters in all scripture. In the ages to come, he will show us the exceeding riches of his grace toward us. And we will sit at the feet of Jesus as he teaches us how gracious and wonderful and good he's been to us. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we just thank you again and we are just in awe and wonder again this Christmas season as we begin. That you would not cast mankind aside, but demonstrate your own unique, peculiar love, perfect love, in sending your Son for us. We see again and are reminded of your great faithfulness to your promises, to Adam and Eve, to the serpent, 
to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to David, to Solomon, throughout the generations until the time of Christ. And even now as scripture unfolds in the New Testament and again in real time, in a real place with real people as we witness events across the globe that seem to suggest the second coming of Christ is soon, though we don't affix a date, we know the promise that he is coming again shall come to pass. That you are a faithful and wonderful God. We thank you again for the great message of Christmas, the great message of hope in a hopeless world today. We shine forth the light of Jesus. We give you thanks now and ask your blessing on each and every one here and those watching at home, Lord. For those who are on the road, we pray for traveling mercies. And Father, we pray that our hearts would be moved to worship you continually all the days of our lives. We praise you and exalt the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed morning, guys.